This track is about geopolitical power, right? <laughs> All right, dear fellow students, welcome back. We hope you're very excited for this final session of today on the geopolitical power track. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming our moderator for this session, journalist and anchor at TV2 News, Anna Soundup. Thank you, and uh, welcome to Jens Birkersen as well. Um, from uh, Rockwool. Uh, Rockwool being a global company in uh, 37 countries right now um, has to deal with uh, geopolitics. It's crucial to them and their business to be able to act in an ever-changing world where people and politicians can do the most horrific things in, in a very short time and putting Jens Birkersen on a lot of work. So what we're going to hear about today is how can Jens Birkersen, as a leader of a global company, um, uh, act and, uh, and play his role in a, in a world where he has to sell his products. He cannot live in an isolated world, even though isolation is one of your products. So um, that's, that's very interesting to hear about that. And I'll give the word to you, Jens Birkersen. Now? Uh, so I'm Swedish, but I will try to do this in, in English. And uh, we are a couple of guys running Danish companies that are Swedish, and it's great to do that. It's not big cultural differences. But I noticed today that originally I had a slot so I could go here in the evening, in the morning, and then do my speech and then go home. And then as the program evolved, I got moved at the end, and I now have the Swedish. Swedish slot at the end, so I uh, look forward to the evening here in Aarhus. Um, my goal with the talk now is, of course, to... Uh, it's not only geopolitical discussions I want to do. I, I also want to present a little bit about Rockwell, and hopefully in the next year we also get some applicants to Rockwell, not only from CBS, but also out from Jylland here, you. So I, I hope you, 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 you like some about Rockwell. Um, I will also give you just a minute, just a minute on Rockwell so you know a little bit about it. And we talk about geo geopolitical power and what you can do about it, what you can't do. Uh, you, you, sometimes you can do very little about it. And then I will move on to another power topic that has turned almost geopolitical. So we'll get to that. So first, doesn't work. There it is. Some of you might have grown up with Rockwell. Not all of you are from Denmark, obviously. We are pure, pure Danish. 93% owned by Danes. Listed, Nasdaq Copenhagen. 10,000 employees, about 2.2 billion turnover. And we do one thing. We basically have a volcano, and we melt stone, and then we spin it, and we make like a cashmere of stone. And uh, we have done this for about 78, 79 years, and we are about four times bigger than anyone else globally in this. So we are total stone fanatics. We only work off stone, and we do products out of that. When you look at the company, is it anyone in the room that can mention a product other than the installation product? Anyone? <laughs> uh, not you, not you, Anders. No, <laughs> not you. So, so actually, with with stone, you you, c you can do a lot a lot of things. For example, that, that's the Empire State Building, and the same on the Eiffel Tower. In order for that building to stand. Every, every, every beam of steel in it, you wrap in stone wall to protect it. Otherwise, if you have a fire in that thing, it collapses. Uh, so that, that's one application. Another application is uh, a business we have called Grodan. If you go to IKEA and uh, you, you buy one of these small houses, 
for kitchen garden, that, that thing you grow on where you put the seeds, that's out of stone wall. A reverse stone wall, it, it's like a stone sponge. If you buy a tomato, even a Danish tomato, big, big likelihood that it's grown on, on, uh, on uh, stone wall. And uh, how many smoke weed here? <laughs> uh, uh, you can't smoke stone wool, but actually when you make medical marijuana, medical marijuana, so that's Canada and part of the US, the by far best substrate to grow it on, and it's a super growth business for us, it's on stone wool. Yeah? Uh, we are very proud of that business. For a while we didn't, we didn't know we didn't know how to kind of deal with that because we are honest people, it's not allowed in Denmark, but we have said if it makes better medical marijuana then, then of course they can do it with our stone wall. Other thing you see up here, up in the roof here, this is one of the reasons why you can hear it. This is a huge business. Denmark is a country of design. Uh, you are a country of uh, active acoustics, Bang Olufsen, you probably all have Sonos, but the passive acoustics of Stormwall is nothing beats it. Huh? I have five kids, I have all this, but the smooth surface in my whole house. It's, it's, it's really a luxury product that is also growing very well. The other thing you heard, that noise, the train passing through here. <laughs> Under the trains you put a bit of Stormwall and, and that, that takes that noise away and the vibration. More applications, uh, water absorption, we can make it into stone sponge, so you don't have to put the water in the sewer system, but you can put it into stone sponge under the ground. Uh, what else? Take one more, final one. Any one of you have a car? Any one of you have a really dirty front rim from the brakes? That's because in Europe you don't use stone wool in the brake pad. In the US and Japan, you mix in stone wool instead of metal, and the rim doesn't do that. And what happens to the rim is not the important thing. The important thing is what happens when you breathe all the dust from the brake. So, what, 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 what's interesting is that if you just do one thing and you work with stone, there are a lot of applications, and you can be very innovative with, with stone wool. Okay, let's get back to the topics. I, um, I'm, I'm a physics person, and, and when you see a topic coming across like this, power, we don't talk about power when we work. Now, politicians might do that, but we don't. We don't think about it. We try to collaborate and work. So, uh, but uh, in terms of power, it's, it, it's in business uh, a little bit of a dirty thing, and we never, never talk about it, but Having gotten the question about geopolitical power, I had to look it up. What is it? It means it means to control our destiny and make sure that nothing comes in the way between us and our goal. Huh? So we said that, and we for surely have there. Yeah. We we for surely have a lot of geopolitical threats that. Uh, Threaten, threaten us as, as a company. For example, when the sanctions started on Russia, um, our business just started to decline, 15% per year. If Trump wins, if Trump wins, he hates everything green, and we are a green company, might impact us negatively. If Hillary wins, she's a hawk, I'm pretty convinced she will be much tougher with Putin, I have four factories in, uh, in Russia, so that would get worse. Um, Brexit, I have business in the UK. Overnight, a 10 million euro business was just gone when that election came because the government, the government subsidized business, they just lost focus. So the product is So you have, this, you have this all the time. You have it all the time. And I get back to how you insulate yourself from that. And then the other geopolitical dimension you have that is really big one, and the one I worry the most about, that's when we compete in countries like India and China. Because in India and China, where there is a lot of growth, you don't only deal with competition, 
you deal with competition and government at the same time. And as a CEO, to compete with a very skilled competitor that have a whole government backing them up or trying to make your life at times difficult, uh, we are often not geared for it. And my time, because to interact with government, you need to go very high level to move anything or you get stuck in bureaucracy. My time is just not enough to do it. And I think that's a geopolitical dimension that you always have to, when you think about uh, emerging market growth in, in complicated places, you have to factor in how much time can you invest yourself in keeping it on track. Because when it goes wrong, it's almost, it's maybe two, the chairman, the CEO, and a couple of more guys that can sort it out because no one listens to anyone else. So, so you have that. So those are, and then of course we get bombarded with quicker and more peculiar things all the time and it goes quicker. And I would say, what, 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 what do we do to, or what do I do uh, to try to keep up with that? And, and I have some very simple recipes. It's not rocket science. A, I read a lot of newspapers. I spend a lot of time trying to understand uh, these things. Uh, you know, not only the economists, that is one thing, but you read a lot of things to try to keep up and listen to your people around. But most of all is that you don't um, follow what you learn in your financing class. At least that's my view. If you have an operationally highly leveraged business, that means when the top line goes down, you, you, you cross that break-even point very quickly because you have a big asset. You need, you need some um, equity on the balance sheet and you need some cash. And you need to be spread and you hope that not every market goes the same way for geopolitical reason at the same time. So by having that equity ratio, in my case we have now 76% equity ratio and we operate almost with zero debt. Which, which is maybe not so smart from your financing class because at the moment if you put the money in the bank uh, you, 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 they threaten you with negative interest. Nevertheless, we do it uh, and the reason is that when these things happen we want to have the, 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 the firing power to act on it. When Spain crashed last time, we went in and kept every sales person and we worked through it. And when the crisis had uh, subsided and we came out on the other side, we have doubled our market share. Uh, and you can only do that if you are not too leveraged. So that, that's my philosophy on the geopolitical side. Okay, let's move on then to the other aspect of power that you may or may not have discussed. Maybe you are way ahead of, of me on this one, but, but I'm just gonna talk a little bit about it. And that is the, the shift of power today. Um, I think it's fair to say that 50 years ago, the CEO, a journalist at Burson, and probably the prime minister, had a lot of power. If you got the biggest daily newspaper against your TV2 with Anders, you were in big trouble and you, it was difficult to work around that. You couldn't kind of do a left hook around it. And I, I think that's changing. I, I think the old power, with this hierarchy is loosening up uh, very quickly. And, and take some uh, examples, the Arab Spring, with the guy in Tunisia that put himself to fire. I, I think 25 years ago, the impact of that wouldn't have been anything. Now it got spread and we got the whole Arab Spring because of one guy's and a lot of guys that then started to tweet. Yeah? Uh, the same thing with the Panama Papers, a network of journalists working together, digging things out, then they launched it, and uh, you, you, can, you can topple anyone. Nothing is secret, you can topple anyone. So observations from that is A, a journalist today is not as powerful as he was. He has to try to fit in in that. It's the social media is there. Um, and also CEO. Things happen very quickly. Control and command works for a few things. 
integrity, for example. We are very, very hard on that central. But the rest is very much geared up now from mission, vision, super detailed plan, to training your teams, to being agile and to deal with the situation. Because when you need to deal with it, it's very quick. Sure, you can in interface very quickly, but you cannot sit and control it from the back seat. They need to act immediately. So, in a way, it's a different power you have as, as, as a CEO. Yeah. Um, then the next aspect of what, what's the impact for us as a company, what's happening with that power. And I don't know, Anders, if you call that geopolitical power. It goes across border. So I don't know if it's on the topic, but it's a very big power we're dealing with here. That's, um, uh, th that's also this people power. You look, for example, at the BP, um, the BP scandal in the Gulf with the oil, uh, the spit. BP had a British p petroleum logo. They were like black big oil. And then some of you might have noticed this flower or some green. They rebranded themselves as a green company. And over 50 days due to one spill, they lost 102 billion of market cap for a happening that cost 50 or 56 billion. But 102 billion market cap just disappeared in, in 50 days and the whole brand was turned into ashes. They just went to pitch black. Uh, and today they are, I think, bottom five light companies in the US. Huh? In 50 days it happened. So when you get this people power against you today, uh, the punch is, is, is much ha harder. Um, I take uh, another example, and, and here is a, a management issue. When you have a brand, we have a brand, Rockwell. In China, there are tons of guys that buy the plastics from the same company as we do, they wrap it in Rockwell, and they deliver a, a, a copy. So typically what companies like uh, my company that have a brand and any other company, you have legal councils that sit and track this. And when they see this, they write a nasty letter and they say, hey, that's our brand. And uh, they try to protect that because that intellectual property and the brand is super important in, in a world where many products otherwise commoditize. But you have this uh, Jensen's Burfus and the uh, Jensen's Fish Restaurant here in Jylland. Without the CEO knowing, probably legal, I don't know what the story was, but probably someone in, in the legal department just sent a letter, started to threaten a, a, a little fish restaurant that was called Jensen's uh, Fish Restaurant. Huh? Because it's a brand infringement in theory, maybe. And that spread, and the same year Jensen's Buffus made a 30 million loss, and I don't think they have recovered since. I think MASH just sailed past, and it shows you how careful you need to be on small things, because you don't need much to ignite that. Once that's ignited, you're in trouble. And typically, old companies don't have 102 million followers like Selena Gomez. <laughs> we, don't have, we don't have that means. So, so you need to be super, super careful. At the same time, if that Jensen's fish restaurant happened in China, nothing would have happened. Nothing. Yeah? So that, that's, that's, that's the power of, uh, of uh, the people. The other uh, thing about that with people is that your rating matters. When you go on, on the TripAdvisor, I don't know if you use it, but if you check a hotel, you're going skiing or whatever, you, you don't care how those ratings were done. You trust them are roughly right, and you pick one of the top five. If you are further down than that, you, you need to be really desperate to go to that skiing resort. Huh? That's how we work with, with everything. And uh, so, so our rating really matters for how much we sell and how much business we do. Uh, another example is, uh, uh, Volkswagen with uh, cheating. Uh, now it's much, much more difficult for Volkswagen to hire people. Because 93%, when you make a study, 
of people, for example, 93% of you, you won't go into tobacco, you probably won't apply for an oil company, and you won't probably apply to Volkswagen because you think it's a bad, you know, sounds like a bad company. So you don't attract people. But uh, the even worse thing is if you are in there, if you are in there and your management mess up in that way, you don't get out of the company. So if you work at Volkswagen and you want to apply for a job elsewhere, or you have worked at Enron, that reference doesn't count. So for you, it's super important to pick the place, because that people power is there also against the individual, and it impacts your CV very quickly. So in 50 days, the Volkswagen CV line turned from a very positive to a very negative thing, and you don't wash that off quickly. Because they will, somehow people think you are a robot, and you did what management said, even though you knew it was wrong. And no one wants to hire that, at least not maybe in Denmark. Huh? So that's, that's over to that. And so that's the people power and the self-ignition of that. Then we move on. Uh, you know, I have a communication department. I'll excuse the next slide. Ah, here. This is Gigi Hadid. Anyone heard about her? No? Yeah. So, uh, you have some very high power individuals in the world today. And they can be 21 years old. Uh, she has 24 million followers, so that's about the same population as Scandinavia. I think we are 27 million. So this uh, 21 year old, probably, they never talk about this, so probably she get, you know, four, five cents per directed kind of product placement. That's pretty cheap, you know, that's pretty cheap for the one making the product placement, and that can be used, and people pay to get that. So she's earning a million on the product placement because she has the channel. Um, but um, comparing the effect, if one of these, or even worse, Elena Gomez, with 102 million followers, decide that, uh, because she has a neighbor, that from our product you get sick, or it's bad, or something, it's very hard to defend yourself against it. Very hard. And you will see it, and you'll say it very quickly. So, uh, a, a new aspect for me is that uh, the Prime Minister of Denmark, Lars Lecke, probably is less important for my business than potentially she can be. <laughs> and I've had dinners with Lars Lecke, but never with her. And, <laughs> and, 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 and it's, it's something we need to learn to deal with. Yeah? And, and how do we deal with it? Yeah? And I think, um, you know, I never you know, industrial person, we produce day in and day out, we develop new products, deliver on our promises. I probably never managed to, you know, act in that league that we, 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 can, we can become that. Coke probably could. I mean, they took Selena Gomez, of course, at the right time, and, and you see that Instagram picture probably with the Coke drinking. They probably paid for that. but. So, we, so what do we do, being just normal industrial people? Um, I think there is one change. And this doesn't work for all companies. This definitely doesn't work if you are selling fatty foods or selling soft drinks. Then you need to work in a different way. But if you do something good, then, then uh, you really need to stick to that. So in our case, what do we do? Uh, the previous about 75 years, we just produced our product. It's super sustainable. So one year's production for us saves in its lifetime 4.6 billion tons of CO2, which is the same as the EU lets out in a year. Huh? So that's us. Huh? We do that. We have never said a word about that. We have never said a word about that. We just did the work, and the people that bought the product, they liked it, and. They like the acoustic thing, like a kid 
in a classroom in a private school with our ceiling will hear 75% more of what the teacher says when you measure. Yeah? If you grow tomato, I don't take the Mariana, tomato, you get four times more or three times more out of a square meter. Yeah? So instead of just doing the work, in, in, in our case, uh, we have to just keep building. Just keep building, but we also need to keep talking about it. And that's a change for us, because we didn't need to do that. You know, self-referencing product, product that people use, they use it again. But to build up a little bit of capital against that, we need to learn to talk about the benefit of, of, of what we do. And if we then sum, sum up um, one of our missions on, and, and part of our purpose on the sustainability side, and one of the big targets we go after is that in, in Europe, 40% of all energy that is used is used by buildings. Huh? Transport is smaller, industry is smaller. They're both below 25%. Housing is the big game. And we happen to have the technology where you can cut that to more in half, and it will be super important to do that. That's part of the solution on the CO2 issue and, and saving energy. So we go after the mission, but we also need to learn to talk about it. And that's not always inherent in an industrial organization. No. That's it. Right. Thank you, uh, Jens Birgersen. Let's have some uh, questions. Um, first of all, when we just have to fix this, uh, I'll try and highlight this. Is it okay, Jakob? Yes, it's the <coughs> you, you talk about, uh, I'll, I'll start out with the questions. You talk about uh, energy taking 40% uh, of a household. Uh, how do you see uh, uh, cheaper energy? Today it's very... Yeah expensive to, to use energy to, to warm up your house in Denmark, but in the future with perhaps cheaper energy or free energy, yeah. what would that mean to, to your business? You, you, you earn from uh, isolating people's houses. Yeah, so, so there, are, there are two payback calculations. And um, um, one is the economical payback, which is uh, you, you install something and then it saves something or generate. And, uh, and obviously, the cheaper the energy, the, the longer time it takes to pay back the installation of the insulation or whatever energy efficiency thing you do. So that's the economical payback. And one of the challenges why we will battle to leave this earth a better place than when we arrived will, will be that the environmental payback is tremendously much faster. So in, in Stonewall's case, um, you, you, you save 50 to 1,500 times the energy you use when you produce the product. So the sustainability or the ecological payback is super short and the economical is, is uh, longer. But then there are other aspects that you have to bake into the equation to try to get more Stonewall now. So when uh, the energy price goes down in this case, I think what you are alluding to is that it goes down because you put a solar panel on the roof, for example, on a house, uh, and that means you have, during the day, free electricity. Uh, so, rather than see, uh, so the, the renewable energy types, they have this intermittency. You can't quite know when they are there, you need a battery. And that's where we come in, by insulating a house, you can run the solar, solar panel during the day, you don't need a battery, you heat up the house, that's your battery, and it stays warm at night. So you have to fit it in in that way. The other aspect um, that I think will be important uh, over time, and, and there will be penalty points if you cannot recycle your product at the end. And today, uh, the construction industry is the biggest waste generator on Earth. One third of all waste comes from old buildings. And uh, how we now start to position in is that in 80 years, it lasts forever, but in 80 years or 50 years, when you take it out, we can just drop it into the furnace again 
and remelt it. We can recycle it. And there isn't an on the building material that you can do that with, actually. So we have a couple of strong points uh, that we need to back in. And then other aspects, like in urbanization, you live smaller and you live closer. And sound insulation will play a role also. So you also hopefully will get an appreciation that putting stonewall in, you don't hear what your neighbor is doing in the evening. Okay, um, <clears throat> you have had, can one say, a helping hand from politicians um, um, with the agreement in Paris on, uh, on uh, climate changes and, and what we sh should do to uh, uh, lower the emissions of uh, CO2. And we have a question here, how dependent is the future of, of political decisions on sustainability? Um, to, to be honest, we haven't seen any change in the business due to any of those things. Uh, so, Does that surprise you? Uh, no, it, it doesn't, because um, when you look at, it goes back a little bit to, you have this public-private partnership, but if you're a politician, and in a way you are rated all the time, you need to do uh, things that are popular. And what's easy to do is to build something new, to take care of renovation is hard because people live in these things. And you have to go in and do something with, um, with uh, existing building stock. And you interfere with people's life. So as a politician, it's much easier to just uh, uh, give a subsidy to buy a heat pump or change the windows. It doesn't disturb to insulate houses, a new built house is easy, you just specify it high. But to go into the building stock that today is only renovated at the pace of about every 200 years, which is too slow, you need to meddle with people's lives. So you need to think really hard and smart and long term to do that. And one way of doing it is to do it when people move in and out and provide a little bit of extra financing to do it when someone is not in the house. Uh, and and that, that's something that often, even though economic, ecologically is great, will end up pretty long, low down on the list because you need to think really hard to figure the scheme out. Okay, we have a question from uh, Christian Lindblad, and you, uh, you uh, mentioned it briefly in, in your uh, opening words. What impact could the presidential election in the US have on your business? It sounded like it was... Uh, Pistil or cooler, as you say in days. Yeah, yeah I, I, I mean, it's both. It's both. So I said it. I mean, Trump doesn't like green, uh, and Hillary will, I think. Doesn't put, like Russia. Uh, yeah, doesn't like Russia. So either way, you know, we have to deal with it. So I wake up after that. On the other hand, California might get the positive result on go uh, medical marijuana. So I have an upset. <laughs> that will save you. <laughs> Okay, and uh, let's take uh, Johan Ambi's question. Uh, how do you, as a market leader, make sure that you stay on top of your branch or your business? Yeah, I, I have a, like a recipe for daily operations, how, how a management team should think. Um, a third, go after growth. A third, uh, raise produ uh, productivity, become more competitive. And a third, be excellent at what you're doing. So. I think what you need to do, if you are the biggest in Stonewall, you need to be, be the best at Stonewall. So you, you need to work really hard and be very critical with yourself uh, uh, and make sure that you are the best on Stonewall, not just the biggest. Okay, and a question about uh, your leadership, your career. What, what is your best career advice? to students who wish to yeah. lead a multinational organization. Yeah, I gave, I gave a lecture on this on Druk, and uh, it took a long time to go through all aspects. But I, I, th I think there, there are uh, a couple of things that are really important. Uh, I, I have an advice, stay about 10% of your age in a role. So try to find a challenge that is long enough. So that typically means two years for you when you start. That is not only projects in five and six months, but early in your career, try, I think, to work along the primary value chain. Stay off the strategic development on that. I, I for example, spent two years as a site supervisor and project manager 
in South Africa when I was 26 years old. I did a lot of hunting also, I got married there. But I learned a lot from the front line. And for example, to be a salesman for a while. There's nothing that can help you more later in your career. It doesn't matter where you are, you need to get that top line to work. Go spend a few years on sales. Don't rush for the position at the beginning because if you get up there and you don't have a few foundations in the core values, I mean leading a manufacturing uh, uh, line. If I was a, a woman in today, I mean you're destined to get promoted, all of you. Huh? Run a factory for two years because what you learn about running a factory when you're 30 years old you, you will score every day. So I really believe where the money flows past in the primary value stream, take a co it's a bit like doing the army service. Waste of time, but do it, you will gain later. You know? I did army service. So, so try, to, try to do those rudimentary things at the beginning while you can. How do you, as a leader, focus on what to do during a day? How do you keep your focus? Yeah. You, could, you, could, uh, you could go to every corner of your business, but how do you, yeah. how do you keep focus? Yeah, so, so, uh, so what we do, first of all, we have a purpose with, with the business. Uh, but I, I believe in an order, I don't like Six Sigma. You know, don't ask me to do Six Sigma. I'm, I'm a theory of constraint guys, partly because a person, because I study physics, and then I like lean and running operations and delegating a lot. Uh, but my, my recipe is try to force your own team, or do. Do the work in your own to team, and think of the business as an hourglass, and that there are some constraints to improving the business, and then pick three to five levers. And you make sure that you spend at least some time every week working on those. So for example, when I do a business review, the first slide uh, of the safety and integrity is always report back on your focus areas. And there we talk, what's the long-term goal? What do we want to achieve with that? But there's also what happened in the, since I saw your last, what's going to happen next week? It's not what's going to happen before Christmas. You, you keep moving those. And if you pick those constraints right, and you act on them, you will see a bigger profitability and more growth. So that's how I do it. Strategic <coughs> focus areas or just focus areas. And every business, every cell, has to define that. After some thinking, some data, they come up with a few, we do those. When one is done, you pop up the next one. That's my philosophy. You have been in the diplomacy as well, very shortly, um, on the uh, embassy yeah. in Moscow. Yeah, yeah. Can you use... So, so, so I, uh, I was in an army service where they wanted us to get a bit more hands-on practice with the Russians. Okay. And, um, <laughs> So I worked at the can embassy. You use, can you use that experience you, you got there today? I, I like Russians because of that, because I, I think I understand them a bit better. You know? I, I worked, I financed my studies by working in, in Russia during the summer. But um, yeah, I, in my observation when I was there was um, at that time IKEA was going to set up. So sometimes I had to go along and interpret for some business people and the royal a gardener and some people go along or where they ended up in problem to go out and you know talk to people and, and try to help and my observation from the uh, that uh, was that my my idea was to become some sort of international player and see the world you know? uh, so I thought the foreign office was a good place to do that but it took about a month or a year to realize that at least from my perspective, today's diplomacy doesn't happen there. I, I felt, and this is very nasty, people don't like me for that, I felt that whole foreign office thing is a bit obsolete compared to what you do when, when you travel around and do business. And, and I like the colorblindness you have in the company. We have people that can be um, very, very open at work, and work absolutely without colors. That goes in the company, and they can be a slightly different person at home, but at work, that diplomacy that happens is really, really good. And that's why I switched. 
There's a question, uh, Anonymous. What is the next biggest challenge for Rockwell as a manufacturing company, given the geopolitical issues in the world, Russia, Brexit, USA? And there was also a question about whether it could be an opportunity for you uh, in the Brexit situation. Yeah, I haven't figured out the benefit yet for us. I, I guess... Um, I guess the benefit for us is that we are relatively small in the UK, so we can live with it, you know. And, and I also have this uh, fundamental view that people exaggerate uh, the problems. People will run around and have all this excitement about the uncertainty, and then eventually some people say, okay, let's roll up the sleeve and fix this now. And when they fix it, it's not going to be as bad as they say now. And that, that's my experience. So you hang in there and, uh, and you need to adapt your cost. You might have to change a, a couple of things. And now with the cheap pound, try to export a bit. It's a benefit. And then, um, and then s just keep, keep working and hopefully it works out. You mentioned earlier that you, you didn't really say out loud how, how good your product was and how... Uh, uh, environmental friendly it was, but there's a question here, how does the Rockwell Group utilize the green movement in order to promote products? I mean, our sustainability toys, we, we didn't really have sustainability goals until this year. We had them internal, but we didn't publish it. We now align six goals with the UN, UN goals. So what we do now, of course, is that we, we put together the benefit we have on society and the environment, and we didn't do, we had it internally, but now we also put it public. So that, that's how we can benefit. But why is it necessary to put it in public? Didn't the products sell themselves uh, without that? Uh, but I think it goes back to that, that build, build, build your capital so that if and when a shitstorm happens, you have something in the bank. You know, that's, uh, uh, I also think there is another reason for doing it. I see that super talents we get to apply for us. It started with some extremely bright students that drew their own conclusions. They started to come a few years back. Uh, and now we have a lot of really good people that apply to us. And we have people from other industries that don't have this story about why do we do that? Why do we do this? What good does this company do for the world? We don't have that problem. And I think talking about it is also a way of attracting people to us because I, I can't demand that every student should sit and do research on every company and understand what is in the core. So we need, we, we need to talk about it. I have some problems with this one, so I cannot highlight uh, the questions. But I don't see it. It's too high. There's a, a question here. How, if at all, do you notice that you are a Swede in a Danish company? Yeah, I, you, you know, I'm here t this evening. I'm staying. Uh, I will go home now and have dinner with my Swedish cousin, who is married to a Danish woman. Uh, so he has kind of taught me everything there is. So I have, I have no, no problem. No, it's. I, I, I would say, um, having been out in the world, um, the the kind of straightforwardness of Danes. Uh, it's probably a lot easier to deal with if you are used to work in the US and Germany and Switzerland than it is to go back and run a company in Sweden. Not every company, you know, different business cultures there. But I think the straightforward Danish way of doing business is, uh, is extremely international with the Danish flavor to it. So it's not difficult at all uh, to fit in as a Swede or a Norwegian. I and th think. this one just popped up. Uh, why do we see relatively many Swedish top leaders in Denmark? Uh, what do you do better? <laughs> no, uh, it has nothing to do, do with that Swedes are better in any way. It, it just has to do with the pipeline. Uh, so if you take, for example, I hired a, a, a CFO and I wanted a Danish CFO in this case uh, and I want the one that have been CFO for a company with industrial activities and more than half a billion euro. Uh, so from half a billion up to 2.2. There were ex exactly 52 people 
52 people in Denmark because the industrial base is relatively small. You have some tremendously good company, but the number of industrial companies, also, we could have 52 applicants from Sweden in a week with that. So it's just, it's just that the industrial tradition is different and, and uh, you don't generate, there's not so many places to practice that type of business because you are, I guess, bigger on agriculture, uh, Danish crown, Lego, trading, there were other, other type of businesses that have been the, the, the bread and butter business in, in Denmark compared to Sweden where we melted steel and we had tons of everything in, on the industrial side. So it's nothing to do with the, with the nationality, just the pipeline. Okay. Um, you said individuals are having a lot of power, one asks here. Do you have some examples of individuals' preferences having an impact on uh, Rockwood? Uh, we, we haven't had uh, any negative uh, like that, and I, I, I think, uh, uh, yeah. Can you I, prepare for, for that situation at all? I, I, A shitstorm? I yeah, think. I, I, th I, th I think you need to be very careful with the way you exert power and never become arrogant as a company so that you don't trigger it. Not because you are afraid, but I believe that's our culture, to be humble and, and decent and, and, and do good. But I, I think we mentally just need to look at these stories a little bit so that with these empowered teams out there, we don't slip on a stupid thing. You know, we can send that letter in China, but if it happens in Denmark and Sweden, you, you need to be a little bit more careful. So you, you just need to be aware and try to think about it. But probably uh, the day it happens, it will come from an angle that you least expect and, and you just need to be extremely quick. You know, don't go home early that day, stay on it until you contain it. Here's a question from Anonymous. I, I have a little trouble with this one, um, sorry. Um, it was a question about how how important you find it to, to share the knowledge you have uh, from your uh, work life with the, the new leaders here at the symposium. Well, uh, uh, how you does can, the... Re you cannot read it here because I have some problems with uh, getting it on the... So, so what was the question? What? How, how important do you find sharing your knowledge with leaders of tomorrow such as at yeah. here at Aarhus Symposium. So, so, so I, I, I believe, uh, and that comes back to that career advice observations over the year, uh, years, you know, stay in the primary value stream, um, say yes to opportunities, you know, it's all total random, you can't create them, you know, they're jumping your way, don't believe. <laughs> you, you know, we, we have a varying degree of luck and we are in a different place. So keep moving around and opportunities come. But I think there is one important thing, at least I find that I learn the most when you find a wing to climb under. Yeah? Um, and that's what I try to tell my people, that uh, taking someone not as a mentor, or saying yes to someone that come and say, tell me how this work. How did you mess this one up? Or have you tried it? How can this go wrong? Let's discuss it. So I, I think it, it, it's an obligation for us to kind of sharing what we think, and probably most of it you think uh, is not valuable in today's world, but it's good for you to hear it, because when you come to us, that's a little bit the way we think. So, so I think it's good to share, and I also want to, uh, in sharing how we are, I also hope that the people that apply to us understand a little bit what the deal is uh, with coming to Rockwell. Uh, we don't have an extreme culture, but if you have heard me and a couple of my guys and you start to read the filter is open, you're going to feel that maybe this is right for me. And, and that you can only do face to face, I think. That's different than reading Bursa next week, you know. That, I think that's face to face. Some bosses say, uh, my door is always open, and, and you talk about uh, taking people under your wing. How do you practice that yourself? How are you... Uh, uh, aware of people who who tries to to get in touch to you with you to yeah. to get this yeah. kind of uh, mentoring. Yeah. So, so, so first of all, in my 
my role, and, and that's a little bit crude, uh, I, I obviously put priority on internal people. Because with 10, 11,000 people on the inside, we try to pick a few and then we spend some extra time. Or so, so we do that because the, the incoming traffic is, is severe in the mailbox. So, so, so I would say you focus on the internal people, don't get too, too diluted. And uh, yeah. And, and now, you, now you can be able to, s to sail something here. Why apply for a job in the Rockwell Group? Yeah, uh, so, yeah. So, so let's go back to the business model. You know, you have seen uh, Uber and Airbnb and all these companies. So you have seen lots of product being commoditized by China. And without having really in-depth business model experience, uh, I worked in several business models. You need to think what business model you jump into. Um, you have automation coming. Is it good to be a hairdresser or not? Will a doctor appointment be automated? So what I thought, and I think that goes for you too, what I thought when I went into Rockwall was that I wanted something that had a purpose and did something clearly good. You know, not selling something that gives you diabetes and try to say you are happy, but you get diabetes. No? Or pornography or weapons. Or, I didn't want to do that. Eh? So something good. The second thing is that we have a massive asset. You know, we build a volcano and we spin it at 10,000 revs and we blow it out and make a wall. That is a massive investment. It's 1,500 degrees. And the product is big and fat like this. So you can't ship it from China. You can't compete from China. So our business is, is uh, uh, the insulation business is a bit like a turkey. It doesn't fly very far. So you set up a business model where you typically are two factories, a competitor and you, sometimes three, and you work locally and you employ local people. And that's 75% of our business. And then we have the big asset. You know, there is no way Uber can make a model and start to trade Stonewall because we produce it. And we have, you know, we are four or five times bigger. So I think you need to think about the resilience about the business model. And I don't know so many businesses where producing locally in any country is the cheapest way to satisfy the customer. So that's how I think. So I think this is this resilience and the big asset business. And, and I would also um, caution a, a little bit of just taking the thin, the thin non-asset based business or just trying to be a platform business. Not every company can be a platform business like SIP or that. And Uber, for example, I question whether their business model, you know, how many are the international travelers that can't do good with just a local taxi app. Why do you need Uber when in a few years you will have uh, Taxi Copenhagen maybe having it too? You know, what's the advantage for Uber when you travel, that you have the same app? Maybe you support local. So I think some of these really hot companies might not be so hot long term. No? The last question for you now, Jens. Um, how has your perception of power changed during your career? Uh, my perception of power? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm, I must uh, admit, I, I, I never thought very much about power. Uh, you know, I, um, Let's call it influence then. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I always had the approach, let's get together and try to figure out what the levers are and then work on it as a team and then the result will give motivation. And I don't spend much time about uh, power, and I make sure that my power never prevents me from going really to the front line to find out what's going on if, if it's a problem. But, so what, but why did you end up being a leader? What was it in your personality or your career that made you so? I, I, I think if, if you travel around, if you move 18, 18 times cross-border uh, and you work in four or five business models, I mean, it's impossible not to become a leader. I, I mean, you, you're all going to get 
you're going to so get. That's what you better do. Just yeah. move no, no, but uh, fundamentally, the, 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 it, it's your own choice if you want to become a leader with your skill and your profile and all the rest. Um, it, it comes with the sacrifice. Then there are people that get it without the hours, but it comes with the sacrifice. And if that's your goal, it was never my goal, if that's your goal, uh, and you work hard on it, it's going to happen. You know? but, but don't overwork it, because to become a leader, you, you, I don't think people will support you if, if they feel that that's your goal in life, to be the leader and the boss. That's not the right reason for doing it. You know? At least that's what I think. And I uh, never put it uh, uh, at the top of my list that that was my goal. Good advice. Thank you, Yetir. Jens Birgersen, on behalf of All Symposium, thank you so much for being here today. We are truly grateful for your contributions at All Symposium 2016. Please accept this gift as a sign of our gratitude. Thank you. As for you, Anas, thank you very much for your contributions today. Please accept this gift as well. As for all of you, the winner of the All awesome Symposium Award 2016 will be announced in the Accenture Auditorium in just a few minutes. Here, there will be room for you on the balconies. However, please be quiet as you enter the Accenture Auditorium as Birgitte Bernersen's session is still underway. We're excited to see you there. Thank you. <laughs>